The Diary of Anne Frank. Review and Anticipate. In Act 1, Anne Frank's father visits the attic where his family and four others hid from the Nazis during World War II. As he holds Anne's diary, the offstage voice of Anne draws him into the past as the families begin their new life hiding from the Nazis. As months drag on, fear and lack of privacy in the attic rooms contributes to increasing tension between the family members. Act 1 ends on the first night of Hanukkah. The group's celebration is interrupted by the sounds of a thief below, who may have heard them. Read Act 2 to learn whether the hiding place has been discovered. Act 2, Scene 1. In the darkness we hear Anne's voice, again reading from the diary. Saturday, the 1st of January, 1944. Another new year has begun and we find ourselves still in our hiding place. We have been here now for one year, five months, and 25 days. It seems that our life is at a standstill. The curtain rises on the scene. It is late afternoon. Everyone is bundled up against the cold. In the main room, Mrs. Frank is taking down the laundry, which is hung across the back. Mr. Frank sits in the chair down left, reading. Margot is lying on the couch with a blanket over her and the many-colored knitted scarf around her throat. Anne is seated at the center table, writing in her diary. Peter, Mr. and Mrs. Von Don, and Dussel are all in their own rooms, reading or lying down. As the lights dim on, Anne's voice continues without a break. We are all a little thinner. The Von Don's discussions are as violent as ever. Mother still does not understand me, but then I don't understand her either. There is one great change, however, a change in myself. I read somewhere that girls of my age don't feel quite certain of themselves, that they become quiet within and begin to think of the miracle that is taking place in their bodies. I think that what is happening to me is so wonderful, not only what can be seen, but what is taking place inside. Each time it has happened, I have a feeling that I have a sweet secret. We hear the chimes and then a hymn being played on the carillion outside. The buzzer of the door below suddenly sounds. Everyone is startled. Mr. Frank tiptoes cautiously to the top of the steps and listens. Again, the buzzer sounds and Meep's V for victory signal. It's Meep! He goes quickly down the steps to unbolt the door. Mrs. Frank calls upstairs to the Von Dons and then to Peter. Wake up, everyone! Meep is here! Anne quickly puts her diary away. Margot sits up, pulling the blanket around her shoulders. Mr. Dussel sits on the edge of his bed, listening, disgruntled. Meep comes up the steps, followed by Mr. Crailer. They bring flowers, books, newspapers, etc. Anne rushes to Meep, throwing her arms affectionately around her. Meep and Mr. Crailer, what a delightful surprise! We came to bring you New Year's greetings. You shouldn't. You should have at least one day to yourselves. She goes quickly to the stove and brings down teacups and tea for all of them. Don't say that. It's so wonderful to see them. I can smell the wind and the cold on your clothes. There you are. How are you, Margot? Feeling any better? I'm all right. We filled her full of every kind of pill so she won't cough and make a noise. She runs into her room to put the flowers in water. Mr. and Mrs. Von Don come from upstairs. Outside, there's the sound of a band playing. Well, hello, Meep, Mr. Crailer. Given a bouquet of flowers to Mrs. Von Don. With my hope for peace in the new year. Meep, have you seen Mousy? Have you seen him anywhere around? I'm sorry, Peter. I asked everyone in the neighborhood had they seen a gray cat, but they said no. Mrs. Frank gives Meep a cup of tea. Mr. Frank comes up the steps, carrying a small cake on a plate. Look what Meep's brought for us. A cake! A cake! He pinches Meep's cheeks gaily and hurries up to the cupboard. I'll get some plates. Dussel, in his room, hastily puts a coat on and starts out to join the others. Thank you, Meep, yeah? You shouldn't have done it. You must have used all of your sugar ration for weeks. Give it to Mrs. Bondon. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's been ages since I even saw a cake. Not since you brought us one last year, without looking at the cake to meep. Remember? Don't you remember you gave us one on New Year's Day? Just this time last year? I'll never forget it because you had peace in 1943 on it. She looks at the cake and reads. 
Peace in 1944. Well, it has to come sometime, you know, as Dussel comes from his room. Hello, Mr. Dussel. How are you? Here's the knife, Liffy. Now, how many of us are there? None for me, thank you. Oh, please, you must. I couldn't. Good, that leaves one, two, three, seven of us. Eight, eight, it's the same number as it always is. I left Margot out. I take it for granted Margot won't eat any. Why wouldn't she? I think it won't harm her. All right, all right. I just didn't want her to start coughing again, that's all. And please, Mrs. Frank should cut the cake. What's it's the not Frank's? Mrs. Frank's cake, is it, Meep? It's for all of us. Mrs. Frank divides things better. Oh, what are you trying to say? Fine. Don't I always give everybody exactly the same, don't I? Forget it, Curly. No, I want an answer, don't I? Yes, yes, everybody gets exactly the same, except Mr. Von Don always gets a little bit more. Von Don advances on Dussel, the knife still in his hand. That's a lie! Dussel retreats before the onslaught of the Von Dons. Please, please, you see what a little sugar cake does to us? It goes right to our heads. Here you are, Mrs. Frank. Thank you. Then to Meep as she goes to the table to cut the cake. Are you sure you won't have some? No, really, I have to go in a minute. The sound of the band fades out in the distance. Maybe Mousy went back to our house. They say that cats, do you ever get over there? I mean, do you suppose you could? I'll try, Peter. The first minute I get, I'll try. But I'm afraid with him gone a week. Make up your mind already. Someone has had a nice big dinner from that cat. Peter's furious, inarticulate. He starts toward Dussel as if to hit him. Mr. Frank stops him. Mrs. Frank speaks quickly to ease the situation. This is delicious, Meep. Delicious. Dirk's in luck to get a girl who can bake like this. I have to run. Dirk's taking me to a party tonight. How heavenly. Remember now what everyone is wearing and what you have to eat and everything so you can tell us tomorrow. I'll give you a full report. Goodbye, everyone. Just a minute. There's something I'd like you to do for me. He hurries off up the stairs to his room. Putty, where are you going? She rushes up the stairs after him, calling hysterically. What do you want? Putty, what are you going to do? What's wrong? Father says he's going to sell her fur coat. She's crazy about that old fur coat. Is it possible? Is it possible that anyone is so silly as to worry about a fur coat in times like this? It's none of your darn business. And if you say one more thing, I'll, I'll take you and I'll, I mean it, I'll. There's a piercing scream from Mrs. Von Don above. She grabs at the fur coat as Mr. Von Don is starting downstairs with it. No, 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 don't you dare take that. You hear? It's mine. Downstairs, Peter turns away, embarrassed, miserable. My father gave me that. You didn't give it to me. You had no right. Let go of it. You hear? Mr. Von Don pulls the coat from her hands and hurries downstairs. Mrs. Von Don sinks to the floor, sobbing. As Mr. Von Don comes into the main room, the others look away, embarrassed for him. Just a little discussion over the advisability of selling this coat. As I've often reminded Mrs. Von Don, it's very selfish of her to keep it when people outside are in such desperate need of clothing. He gives the coat to meat. So if you will, please, to sell it for us, it should fetch a good price. And by the way, will you get me cigarettes? I don't care what kind they are. Get all you can. It's terribly difficult to get them, Mr. Von Don, but I'll try. Goodbye. She goes. Mr. Frank follows her down the steps to bolt the door after her. Mrs. Frank gives Mr. Crailer a cup of tea. Are you sure you won't have some cake, Mr. Crailer? I'd better not. You're still feeling badly? What does your doctor say? I haven't been to him. Now, Mr. Crailer. Oh, I tried, but you can't get near a doctor these days. They're so busy. After weeks, I finally managed to get one on the telephone. I told him I'd like an appointment. I wasn't feeling very well. You know what he answers? Over the telephone. Stick out your tongue. They laugh. He turns to Mr. Frank as Mr. Frank comes back. I have some contracts here. I wonder if you'd look over them with me? Of course. If we could go downstairs, 
Mr. Frank starts ahead. Mr. Crayler speaks to the others. Will you forgive us? I won't keep him but a minute. He starts to follow Mr. Frank down the steps. What's happened? Something's happened, hasn't it, Mr. Crayler? Mr. Crayler stops and comes back, trying to reassure Margo with a pretense of casualness. No, really, I want your father's advice. Something's gone wrong, I know it. If it's something that concerns us here, it's better that we all hear it. But the children? What they'd imagine would be worse than any reality. As Mr. Crayler speaks, they all listen with intense apprehension. Mrs. Von Don comes down the stairs and sits on the bottom step. It's a man in the storeroom. I don't know whether or not you remember him. Carl, about 50, heavy set, nearsighted. He came with us just before you left. He was from Utrecht. That's the man. A couple of weeks ago, when I was in the storeroom, he closed the door and asked me, how's Mr. Frank? What do you hear from Mr. Frank? I told him I only knew there was a rumor that you were in Switzerland. He said he'd heard that rumor too, but he thought I might know something more. I didn't pay any attention to it, but then a thing happened yesterday. He'd brought some invoices to the office for me to sign. As I was going through them, I looked up. He was standing, staring at the bookcase, your bookcase. He said he thought he remembered a door there. Wasn't there a door there that used to go up to the loft? Then he told me he wanted more money, 20 guilders more a week. Blackmail, 20 guilders, very modest blackmail. That's just the beginning. You know what I think? He was the thief who was down here that night. That's how he knows we're here. How was it left? What did you tell him? I said I had to think about it. What shall I do? Pay him the money? Take a chance on firing him? Or what? I don't know. Don't fire him, pay him what he asks. Keep him here where you can have your eye on him. Is it so much that he's asking? What are they paying nowadays? He could get it in a war plant, but this isn't a war plant, mind you. I don't know if he really knows, or if he doesn't know. Offer him half, then we'll soon find out if it's blackmail or not. And if it is, we've got to pay it, haven't we? Anything he asks, we've got to pay. Let's decide that when the time comes. This may be all my imagination, you get to a point these days where you suspect everyone and everything, again and again, on some simple look or word. I found myself. The telephone rings in the office below. There's the telephone. What does that mean? The telephone ringing on a holiday. That's my wife. I told her I had to go over some papers in my office to call me there when she got out of church. He starts out. I'll offer him half then. Goodbye. We'll hope for the best. The group calls their goodbyes half-heartedly. Mr. Frank follows Mr. Crayler to bolt the door below. During the following scene, Mr. Frank comes back up and stands listening, disturbed. You can thank your son for this, smashing the light. I tell you, it's just a question of time now. He goes to the window at the back and stands looking out. Sometimes I wish the end would come, whatever it is. Margo! Anne goes to Margo, sitting beside her on the couch with her arms around her. Then at least we'd know where we were. You should be ashamed of yourself, talking that way. Think how lucky we are. Think of the thousands dying in the war every day. Think of the people in concentration camps. What's the good of that? What's the good of thinking of misery when you're already miserable? That's stupid. Anne! As Anne goes on raging at her mother, Mrs. Frank tries to break in in an effort to quiet her. We're young, Margo and Peter and I. You grown-ups have had your chance, but look at us. If we begin thinking of all the horror in the world, we're lost. We're trying to hold on to some kind of ideals when everything, ideals, hopes, everything are being destroyed. It isn't our fault that the world is in such a mess. We weren't around when all this started, so don't try to take it out on us. She rushes off to her room, slamming the door after her. She picks up a brush from the chest and hurls it to the floor. Then she sits on the settee, trying to control her anger. She talks as if we started the war. Did we start the war? He spots Anne's cake. As he starts to take it, Peter anticipates him.
She left her cake. He starts for Anne's room with the cake. There's silence in the main room. Mrs. Von Don goes up to her room, followed by Von Don. Dussel stays looking out the window. Mr. Frank brings Mrs. Frank her cake. She eats it slowly, without relish. Mr. Frank takes his cake to Margot and sits quietly on the sofa beside her. Peter stands in the doorway of Anne's darkened room, looking at her, then makes a little movement to let her know he is there. Anne sits up quickly, trying to hide the signs of her tears. Peter holds out the cake to her. You left this. Thanks. Peter starts to go out, then comes back. I thought you were fine just now. You know just how to talk to them. You know just how to say it. I'm no good. I never can think, especially when I'm mad. That Dussel, when he said that about Mousy, someone eating him, all I could think is, I wanted to hit him. I wanted to give him such a, uh, that he, that's what I used to do when there was an argument at school. That's the way I, but here, and an old man like that, it wouldn't be so good. You're making a big mistake about me. I do it all wrong. I say too much. I go too far. I hurt people's feelings. Dussel leaves the window, going to his room. I think you're just fine. What I want to say, if it wasn't for you around here, I don't know. What I mean. Peter's interrupted by Dussel's turning on the light. Dussel stands in the doorway, startled to see Peter. Peter advances toward him forbiddingly. Dussel backs out of the room. Peter closes the door on him. Do you mean it, Peter? Do you really mean it? I said it, didn't I? Thank you, Peter. In the main room, Mr. and Mrs. Frank collect the dishes and take them to the sink, washing them. Margot lies down again on the couch. Dussel, lost, wanders into Peter's room and takes up a book, starting to read. Peter looking at the photographs on the wall. You've got quite a collection. Wouldn't you like some in your room? I could give you some. Heaven knows you spent enough time in there, doing heaven knows what. It's easier. A fight starts or an argument. I duck in there. You're lucky. Having a room to go to. His lordship is always here. I hardly ever get a minute alone. When they start in on me, I can't duck away. I have to stand there and take it. You gave some of it back just now. I get so mad. They form their opinions about everything. But we, we're still trying to find out. We have problems here that no other people our age have ever had. And just as you think you've solved them, something comes along and bang, you have to start all over again. At least you've got someone that you can talk to. Not really. Mother, I never discuss anything serious with her. She doesn't understand. Father's all right. We can talk about everything. Everything but one thing. Mother, he simply won't talk about her. I don't think you can be really intimate with anyone if he holds something back, do you? I think your father's fine. Oh, he is, Peter. He is. He's the only one who's ever given me the feeling that I have any sense. But anyway, nothing can take the place of school and play and friends of your own age. Or near your age, can it? I suppose you miss your friends and all. It isn't just... She breaks off, staring up at him for a second. Isn't it funny, you and I... Here we've been seeing each other every minute for almost a year and a half, and this is the first time we've ever really talked. It helps a lot to have someone to talk to, don't you think? It helps you to let off steam. Well, any time you want to let off steam, you can come into my room. I can get up an awful lot of steam. You'll have to be careful how you say that. It's all right with me. Do you mean it? I said it, didn't I? He goes out. Anne stands in her doorway looking after him. As Peter gets to his door... He stands for a minute looking back at her. Then he goes into his room. Dussel rises as he comes in and quickly passes him going out. He starts across for his room. Anne sees him coming and pulls her door shut. Dussel turns back towards Peter's room. Peter pulls his door shut. Dussel stands there, bewildered, forlorn. The scene slowly dims out. The curtain falls on the scene. Anne's voice comes over in the darkness, faintly at first and then with growing strength. We've had bad news. The people from whom meat got our ration books have been arrested, so we have had to cut down on our food. Our stomachs are so empty that they rumble and make strange noises, all in different keys. Mr. Von Don's is deep and low, like a bass fiddle. Mine is high, whistling like a flute. As we all sit around waiting for supper, it's like an orchestra tuning up. It only needs Toscanini to raise his baton, and we'd be off in the ride of the Valkyries. 
Monday, the 6th of March, 1944. Mr. Crayler is in the hospital. It seems he has ulcers. Pim says we are his ulcers. Meep has to run the business, and us too. The Americans have landed on the southern tip of Italy. Father looks for a quick finish to the war. Mr. Dussel is waiting every day for the warehouse man to demand more money. Have I been skipping too much from one subject to another? I can't help it. I feel that spring is coming. I feel it in my whole body and soul. I feel utterly confused. I am longing, so longing, for everything. For friends. For someone to talk to. Someone who understands. Someone young, who feels as I do. As these last lines are being said, the curtain rises on the scene. The lights dim on. Anne's voice fades out. Scene 2. It is evening, after supper. From outside we hear the sound of children playing. The grown-ups, with the exception of Mr. Von Don, are all in the main room. Mrs. Frank is doing some mending. Mrs. Von Don is reading a fashion magazine. Mr. Frank is going over business accounts. Dussel, in his dentist jacket, is pacing up and down, impatient to get into his bedroom. Mr. Von Don is upstairs working on a piece of embroidery in an embroidery frame. In his room, Peter is sitting before the mirror, smoothing his hair. As the scene goes on, he puts on his tie brushes his coat and puts it on, preparing himself meticulously for a visit from Anne. On his wall are now hung some of Anne's motion picture stars. In her room, Anne, too, is getting dressed. She stands before the mirror in her slip, trying various ways of dressing her hair. Margot is seated on the sofa, hemming a skirt for Anne to wear. In the main room, Dussel can stand it no longer. He comes over, rapping sharply on the door of his and Anne's bedroom. No, no, Mr. Dussel, I am not dressed yet. Dussel walks away, furious, sitting down and burying his head in his hands. Anne turns to Margot. How is that? How does that look? Fine. You didn't even look. Of course I did. It's fine. Margot, tell me, am I terribly ugly? Oh, stop fishing. No, no, tell me. Of course you're not. You've got nice eyes and a lot of animation. And... A little vague, aren't you? She reaches over and takes a brassiere out of Margot's sewing basket. She holds it up to herself, studying the effect in the mirror. Outside, Mrs. Frank, feeling sorry for Dussel, comes over, knocking at the girl's door. May I come in? Come in, mother. Mr. Dussel's impatient to get in here. Heavens, he takes the room for himself the entire day. Anne, dear, you're not going in again tonight to see Peter. That is my intention. But you've already spent a great deal of time in there today. I was in there exactly twice. Once to get the dictionary, and then three quarters of an hour before supper. Aren't you afraid you're disturbing him? Mother, I have some intuition. Then may I ask you this much, Anne. Please don't shut the door when you go in. You sound like Mrs. Von Don. She throws the brazier back in Margot's sewing basket and picks up her blouse, putting it on. No, no, I don't mean to suggest anything wrong. I only wish that you wouldn't expose yourself to criticism, that you wouldn't give Mrs. Von Don the opportunity to be unpleasant. Mrs. Von Don doesn't need an opportunity to be unpleasant. Everyone's on the edge, worried about Mr. Crayler. This is one more thing. I'm sorry, Mother. I'm going to Peter's room. I'm not going to let Petronella Von Don spoil our friendship. Mrs. Frank hesitates for a second, then goes out closing the door after her. She gets a pack of playing cards and sits at the center table playing solitaire. In Anne's room, Margot hands the finished skirt to Anne. As Anne is putting it on, Margot takes off her high-heeled shoes and stuffs paper on the toes so that Anne can wear them. Why don't you two talk in the main room? It'd save a lot of trouble. It's hard on Mother having to listen to those remarks from Mrs. Von Don and not say a word. Why doesn't she say a word? I think it's ridiculous to take it and take it. You don't understand Mother at all, do you? She can't talk back. She's not like you. It's just not in her nature to fight back. Anyway, the only one I worry about is you. I feel awfully guilty about you. She sits on the stool near Margot, putting on Margot's high-heeled shoes. What about? I mean, every time I go into Peter's room, I have a feeling I may be hurting you. Margot shakes her head. I know if it were me, I'd be wild. I'd be desperately jealous if it were me. Well, I'm not. You don't feel badly? Really? Truly? You're not jealous? Of course I'm jealous. 
Jealous that you've got something to get up in the morning for, but jealous of you and Peter? No. Anne goes back to the mirror. Maybe there's nothing to be jealous of. Maybe he doesn't really like me. Maybe I'm just taking the place of his cat. She picks up a pair of short white gloves, putting them on. Wouldn't you like to come in with us? I have a book. The sound of the children playing outside fades out. In the main room, Dussel can stand it no longer. He jumps up, going to the bedroom door, and knocking sharply. Will you please let me in my room? Just a minute, dear, dear Mr. Dussel. She picks up her mother's pink stole and adjusts it elegantly over her shoulders, then gives a last look in the mirror. Well, here I go, to run the gauntlet. She starts out, followed by Margot. Dussel, as she appears, sarcastic. Thank you so much. Dussel goes into his room. Anne goes toward Peter's room, passing Mrs. Von Don and her parents at the center table. My God, look at her. Anne pays no attention. She knocks at Peter's door. I don't know what good it is to have a son. I never see him. He wouldn't care if I killed myself. Peter opens the door and stands aside for Anne to come in. Just a minute, Anne. She goes to them at the door. I'd like to say a few words to my son. Do you mind? Peter and Anne stand waiting. Peter, I don't want you staying up till all hours tonight. You've got to have your sleep. You're a growing boy. You hear? Anne won't stay late. She's going to bed promptly at nine, aren't you, Anne? Yes, mother, to Mrs. Von Don. May we go now? Are you asking me? I didn't know I had anything to say about it. Listen for the chimes, Anne, dear. The two young people go off into Peter's room, shutting the door after them. In my day, it was the boys who called on the girls, not the girls on the boys. You know how young people like to feel that they have secrets. Peter's room is the only place where they can talk. Talk? That's not what they called it when I was young. Mrs. Von Don goes off to the bathroom. Margot settles down to read her book. Mr. Frank puts his papers away and brings a chess game to the center table. He and Mrs. Frank start to play. In Peter's room, Anne speaks to Peter, indignant, humiliated. Aren't they awful? Aren't they impossible? Treating us as if we were still in the nursery. She sits on the cot. Peter gets a bottle of pop and two glasses. Don't let it bother you. It doesn't bother me. I suppose you can't really blame them. They think back to what they were like at our age. They don't realize how much more advanced we are. When you think what wonderful discussions we've had. Oh, I forgot. I was going to bring you some more pictures. Oh, these are fine. Thanks. Don't you want some more? Meep just brought me some new ones. Maybe later. He gives her a glass of pop and taking some for himself sits down facing her. I remember when I got that. I won it. I bet Yopi that I could eat five ice cream cones. We'd all been playing ping pong. We used to have heavenly times. We'd finish up with ice cream at the Delphi, or the Oasis, where Jews were allowed. There'd always be a lot of boys. We'd laugh and joke. I'd like to go back to it for a few days or a week. But after that, I know I'd be bored to death. I think more seriously about life now. I want to be a journalist or something. I love to write. What do you want to do? I thought I might go off someplace, work on a farm or something, some job that doesn't take much brains. You shouldn't talk that way. You've got the most awful inferiority complex. I know I'm not smart. That isn't true. You're much better than I am in dozens of things. Arithmetic and algebra and... Well, you are a million times better than I am in algebra. You like Margot, don't you? Right from the start you liked her. Liked her much better than me. Oh, I don't know. In the main room, Mrs. Von Don comes from the bathroom and goes over to the sink, polishing a coffee pot. It's all right. Everyone feels that way. Margot's so good. She's sweet and bright and beautiful, and I'm not. I wouldn't say that. Oh, no, I'm not. I know that. I know quite well that I'm not a beauty. I never have been and never shall be. I don't agree at all. I think you're pretty. That's not true. And another thing. You've changed. From at first, I mean. I have? I used to think you were awful noisy. And what do you think now, Peter? How have I changed? Well, er, you're quieter. In his room, Dussel takes his pajamas and toilet articles and goes into the bathroom to change. I'm glad you don't just hate me. I never said that. I bet when you get out of here, you'll th never think of me again. That's crazy. When you get back with all your friends, you're going to say, Now what did I ever see in that Mrs. Quack Quack? I haven't got friends. Oh, Peter, of course you have. Everyone has friends. 
Not me. I don't want any. I get along all right without them. Does that mean you can get along without me? I think of myself as your friend. No. If they were all like you, it would be different. He takes the glasses and the bottle and puts them away. There is a second silence and then Anne speaks, hesitantly, shyly. Peter, did you ever kiss a girl? Yes, once. That picture's crooked. Was she pretty? Huh? The girl that you kissed. I don't know. I was blindfolded. It was at a party, one of those kissing games. Oh, I don't suppose that really counts, does it? It didn't with me. I've been kissed twice. Once a man I'd never seen before kissed me on the cheek when he picked me up off the ice and I was crying. And the other was Mr. Coopers, a friend of father's who kissed my hand. You wouldn't say those counted, would you? I wouldn't say so. I know almost for certain that Margot would never kiss anyone unless she was engaged to them. And I'm sure, too, that mother never touched a man before Pim. But I don't know. Things are so different now. What do you think? Do you think a girl shouldn't kiss anyone except if she's engaged or something? It's so hard to try to think about what to do, when here we are with the whole world falling around our ears, and you think, well, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and what do you think? I suppose it depends on the girl. Some girls, anything they do is wrong. But others, well, it wouldn't necessarily be wrong with them. The Krillian starts to strike nine o'clock. I've always thought that when two people... Nine o'clock. I have to go. That's right. Good night. There's a second pause. Then Peter gets up and moves toward the door. You won't let them stop you coming. No. Sometimes I might bring my diary. There are so many things in it that I want to talk over with you. There's a lot about you. What kind of thing? I wouldn't want you to see some of it. I thought you were a nothing, just the way you thought about me. Did you change your mind, the way I changed my mind about you? Well, you'll see. For a second, Anne stands looking up at Peter, longing for him to kiss her. As he makes no move, she turns away. Then suddenly, Peter grabs her awkwardly in his arms, kissing her on the cheek. Anne walks out, dazed. She stands for a minute, her back to the people in the main room. As she regains her poise, she goes to her mother and father and Margot, silently kissing them. They murmur their goodnights to her. As she is about to open her bedroom door, she catches sight of Mrs. Von Don. She goes quickly to her, taking her face in her hands and kissing her first on one cheek and then on the other. Then she hurries off into her room. Mrs. Von Don looks after her and then looks over at Peter's room. Her suspicions are confirmed. Aha! The lights dim out. The curtain falls on the scene. In the darkness, Anne's voice comes faintly at first and then with growing strength. By this time, we all know each other so well that if anyone starts to tell a story, the rest can finish it for him. We're having to cut down still further on our meals. What makes it worse? The rats have been at work again. They've carried off some of our precious food. Even Mr. Dussel wishes now that Mousy was here. Thursday, the 20th of April, 1944. Invasion fever is mounting every day. Meep tells us that people outside talk of nothing else. For myself... Life has become much more pleasant. I often go to Peter's room after supper. Oh, don't think I'm in love, because I'm not. But it does make life more bearable to have someone with whom you can exchange views. No more tonight. P.S. I must be honest. I must confess that I actually live for the next meeting. Is there anything lovelier than to sit under the skylight and feel the sun on your cheeks and have a darling boy in your arms? I admit now that I'm glad the Von Dons had a son and not a daughter. I've outgrown another dress. That's the third. I'm having to wear Margot's clothes after all. I'm working hard on my French, and I'm now reading La Belle Nivernaise. As she is saying the last lines, the curtain rises on the scene. The lights dim on as Anne's voice fades out. Scene three. It is night. A few weeks later, everyone is in bed. There is complete quiet. In the Von Don's room, a match flares up for a moment and then is quickly put out. Mr. Von Don, in bare feet, dressed in underwear and trousers, is dimly seen coming stealthily down the stairs and into the main room, where Mr. and Mrs. Frank and Margot are sleeping. He goes to the food safe and again lights a match. Then he cautiously opens the safe, taking out a half loaf of bread. As he closes the safe, it creaks. He stands rigid. Mrs. Frank sits up in bed. She sees him. Otto! Otto! Come a schnell! The rest of the people wake, hurriedly getting up. Boss is los. Boss is past the earth. 
Dussel, followed by Anne, comes from his room. Er stellt das Essen. You, you, give me that. Putty, putty, what is it? You dirty thief, stealing food, you good for nothing. Mr. Dussel, for God's sake, help me, Peter. Peter comes over, trying with Mr. Frank to separate the two struggling men. Let him go, let go. Dussel drops Mr. Von Don, pushing him away. He shows them the end of a loaf of bread that he has taken from Von Don. You greedy, selfish, Margot turns on the lights. Putty, what is it? All of Mrs. Frank's gentleness, her self-control is gone. She is outraged, in a frenzy of indignation. The bread! He was stealing the bread! It was you, and all the time we thought it was the rats. Mr. Von Don, how could you? I'm hungry. We're all of us hungry. I see the children getting thinner and thinner. Your own son, Peter. I've heard him moan in his sleep, he's so hungry. And you come in the night and steal food that should go to them? To the children? He needs more food than the rest of us. He's used to more. He's a big man. Mr. Von Don breaks away, going over and sitting on the couch. And you, you are worse than he is. You're a mother, and yet you sacrifice your child to this man? This, this, Edith, Edith. Margot picks up the pink woolen stole, putting it over her mother's shoulders. Don't think I haven't seen you, always saving the choicest bits for him. I've watched you day after day, and I've held my tongue, but not any longer, not after this. Now I want him to go. I want him to get out of here. Edith, get out of here? What do you mean? Just that. Take your things and get out. You're speaking in anger. You cannot mean what you are saying. I mean exactly that. Mrs. Von Don takes a cover from the Frank's bed, pulling it about her. For two long years we have lived here, side by side. We have respected each other's rights. We have managed to live in peace. Are we now going to throw it all away? I don't know this will ever happen again, will it, Mr. Von Don? No, no. He steals once, he'll steal again. Mr. Von Don, holding his stomach, starts for the bathroom. Anne puts her arms around him, helping him up the step. Edith, please, let us be calm. We'll all go to our rooms, and afterwards we'll sit down quietly and talk this out. We'll find some way. No, no, no more talk. I want them to leave. You'd put us out on the streets? There are other hiding places. A cellar? A closet? I know, and we have no money left even to pay for that. I'll give you money. Out of my own pocket, I'll give it gladly. She gets her purse from a shelf and comes back with it. Mr. Frank, you told Putty you'd never forget what he'd done for you when you came to Amsterdam. You said you could never repay him, that you... I should have spoken out long ago. You can't be nice to some people. There would have been plenty for all of us if you hadn't come in here. We don't need the Nazis to destroy us. We're destroying ourselves. He sits down with his head in his hands. Mrs. Frank goes to Mrs. Von Don. Give this to me. She'll find you a place. Mother, you're not putting Peter out. Peter hasn't done anything. He'll stay, of course. When I say I must protect the children, I mean Peter, too. Peter rises from the steps where he has been sitting. I'd have to go if father goes. Mr. Von Don comes from the bathroom. Mrs. Von Don hurries to him and takes him to the couch. Then she gets water from the sink to bathe his face. He's no father to you, that man. He doesn't know what it is to be a father. I wouldn't feel right. I couldn't stay. Very well, then. I'm sorry. No, Peter, no! Peter goes into his room, closing the door after him. Anne turns back to her mother, crying. I don't care about the food. They can have mine. I don't want it. Only don't send them away. It'll be daylight soon. They'll be caught. Please, mother. They're not going now. They'll stay here until Meat finds them a place. But one thing I insist on, he must never come down here again. He must never come to this room where the food is stored. We'll divide what we have, an equal share for each. Dussel hurries over to get a sack of potatoes from the food safe. Mrs. Frank goes on to Mrs. Von Don. You can cook it here and take it up to him. Dussel brings the sack of potatoes back to the center table. Oh, no, no. We haven't sunk so far that we're going to fight over a handful of rotten potatoes. Mrs. Frank. Mr. Frank, Margot, Anne, Peter, Mrs. Von Don, Mr. Von Don, myself, Mrs. Frank. The buzzer sounds in Meep's signal. It's Meep! He hurries over, getting his overcoat and putting it on. 
At this hour? It is trouble. I beg you, don't let her see a thing like this. Anne, Peter, Mrs. Von Don, Mr. Von Don, myself. Stop it! Stop it! Mr. Frank, Margot, Anne, Peter, Mrs. Von Don, Mr. Von Don, myself, Mrs. Frank. You're keeping the big ones for yourself? All the big ones? Look at the size of that! And that! Dissel continues on with his dividing. Peter, with his shirt and trousers on, comes from his room. Stop it! Stop it! We hear Meep's excited voice speaking to Mr. Frank below. Mr. Frank, the most wonderful news! The invasion has begun! Go on! Tell them! Tell them! Meep comes running up the steps ahead of Mr. Frank. She has a man's raincoat on over her nightclothes and a bunch of orange-colored flowers in her hand. Did you hear that, everybody? Did you hear what I said? The invasion has begun! The invasion! They all stare at Meep, unable to grasp what she is telling them. Peter's the first to recover his wits. Where? When? When, Meep? It began early this morning. As she talks on, the realization of what she has said begins to dawn on them. Everyone goes crazy. A wild demonstration takes place. Mrs. Frank hugs Mr. Von Don. Oh, Mr. Von Don, did you hear that? Dussel embraces Mrs. Von Don. Peter grabs a frying pan and parades around the room, beating on it, singing the Dutch national anthem. Anne and Margot follow him, singing, weaving in and out among the excited grown-ups. Margot breaks away to take the flowers from meat and distribute them to everyone. While this pandemonium is going on, Mrs. Frank tries to make herself heard above the excitement. How do you know? The radio. The BBC. They said they landed on the coast of Normandy. The British? British, Americans, French, Dutch, Poles, Norwegians, all of them, more than 4,000 ships. Churchill spoke, and General Eisenhower, D-Day they call it. Thank God it's come. At last! I'm going to tell Mr. Crailer, this will be better than any blood transfusion. What part of Normandy did they land, did they say? Normandy, that's all I know now. I'll be up the minute I hear some more. She goes hurriedly out. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Mrs. Frank indicates that he has forgotten to bolt the door after meat. He hurries down the steps. Mr. Von Don, sitting on the couch, suddenly breaks into a convulsive sob. Everybody looks at him, bewildered. Putty! Putty! What is it? What happened? Please, I'm so ashamed. Mr. Frank comes back up the steps. Oh, for God's sake! Don't, Putty! It doesn't matter now. Didn't you hear what Meep said? The invasion has come. We're going to be liberated. This is a time to celebrate. He embraces Mrs. Frank and then hurries to the cupboard and gets the cognac and a glass. To steal bread from children. We've all done things that we're ashamed of. Look at me, the way I've treated Mother. So mean and hard to her. No, Anake, no. Anne runs to her mother, putting her arms around her. Oh, Mother, I was. I was awful. Not like me. Not one is as bad as me. Stop it now. Let's be happy. Hear, hear. Schnapps. La Caim. Von Don takes the cognac. They all watch him. He gives them a feeble smile. Anne puts up her fingers in a V for victory sign. As Von Don gives an answering V sign, they are startled to hear a loud sob from behind them. It is Mrs. Frank, stricken with remorse. She is sitting on the other side of the room. Mr. Von Don brings her his glass of cognac. No, no, you were right. That I should speak that way to you. Our friends, our guests, she starts to cry again. Stop it. You're spoiling the whole invasion. As they are comforting her, the lights dim out. The curtain falls. We're all in much better spirits these days. There's still excellent news of the invasion. The best part about it is that I have a feeling that friends are coming. Who knows? Maybe I'll be back in school by fall. Ha <laughs> ha! The joke is on us. The warehouse man doesn't know a thing, and we are... Paying him all that money. Wednesday, the 2nd of July, 1944. The invasion seems temporarily to be bogged down. Mr. Crailer has to have an operation, which looks bad. The Gestapo have found the radio that was stolen. Mr. Dussel says they'll trace it back and back to the thief. And then, it's just a matter of time till they get to us. Everyone is low. Even poor Pim can't raise their spirits. I have often been downcast myself, but never in despair. I can shake off everything if I write, but... And that is the great question. Will I ever be able to write well? I want to so much. I want to go on living, even after my death. Another birthday has gone by now, so now I am 15. Already I know what I want. I have a goal, an opinion. 
As this is being said, the curtain rises on the scene, the lights dim on, and Anne's voice fades out. Scene 4. It is an afternoon a few weeks later. Everyone but Margot is in the main room. There is a sense of great tension. Both Mrs. Frank and Mr. Von Don are nervously pacing back and forth. Dussel is standing at the window, looking down, fixedly at the street below. Peter is at the center table, trying to do his lessons. Anne sits opposite him, writing in her diary. Mrs. Von Don is seated on the couch, her eyes on Mr. Frank as he sits reading. The sound of a telephone ringing comes from the office below. They are all rigid, listening tensely. Dussel rushes down to Mr. Frank. There it goes again. The telephone. Mr. Frank, do you hear? Yes, I hear. But this is the third time, Mr. Frank. The third time in quick succession. It's a signal. I tell you, it's Meat trying to get us. For some reason, she can't come to us, and she's trying to warn us of something. Please, please. You're wasting your breath. Something has happened, Mr. Frank. For three days now, Meep hasn't been to see us, and today not a man has come to work. You may have lost track of the days. You, with the diary there, what day is it? I don't lose track of the days. I know exactly what day it is. It's Friday, the 4th of August. Friday, and not a man at work. He rushes back to Mr. Frank, pleading with him, almost in tears. I tell you, Mr. Crayler's dead. That's the only explanation. He's dead and they've closed down the building, and Meep's trying to tell us. She'd never telephone us. Mr. Frank, answer that. I beg you, answer it. No. Just pick it up and listen. You don't have to speak. Just listen and see if it's me. For God's sake, I ask you. No. I told you no. I'll do nothing that might let anyone know we're in the building. Mr. Frank's right. There's no need to tell us what side you're on. If we wait patiently, quietly, I believe that help will come. There's silence for a minute as they all listen to the telephone ringing. I'm going down. He rushes down the steps. Mr. Frank tries ineffectually to hold him. Dussel runs to the lower door, unbolting it. The telephone stops ringing. Dussel bolts the door and comes slowly back up the steps. Too late. Mr. Frank goes to Margot in Anne's bedroom. So we just wait here until we die. I can't stand it. I'll kill myself. I'll kill myself. For God's sake, stop it. In the distance, a German military band is heard playing a Viennese waltz. I think you'd be glad if I did. I think you want me to die. Whose fault is it we're here? Mrs. Von Don starts for her room. He follows, talking at her. We could have been safe somewhere, in America or Switzerland. But no, no, you wouldn't leave when I wanted to. You couldn't leave your things. You couldn't leave your precious furniture. Don't touch me. She hurries up the stairs, followed by Mr. Von Don. Peter, unable to bear it, goes to his room. Anne looks after him, deeply concerned. Dussel returns to his post at the window. Mr. Frank comes back into the main room and takes a book, trying to read. Mrs. Frank sits near the sink, starting to peel some potatoes. Anne quietly goes to Peter's room, closing the door after her. Peter is lying face down on the cot. Anne leans over him, holding him in her arms, trying to bring him out of his despair. Look, Peter, the sky! She looks up through the skylight. What a lovely, lovely day! Aren't the clouds beautiful? You know what I do when it seems as if I couldn't stand being cooped up for one more minute? I think myself out. I think myself on a walk in the park where I used to go with Pim, where the jonquils and the crocus and the violets grow down the slopes. You know the most wonderful part about thinking yourself out? You can have it any way you like. You can have roses and violets and chrysanthemums all blooming at the same time. It's funny. I used to take it all for granted, and now I've gone crazy about everything to do with nature. Haven't you? I've just gone crazy. I think if something doesn't happen soon, if we don't get out of here, I can't stand much more of it. I wish you had a religion, Peter. No thanks, not me. Oh, I don't mean you have to be orthodox, or believe in heaven and hell and purgatory and things. I just mean some religion. It doesn't matter what. Just to believe in something. When I think of all that's out there, the trees and flowers and seagulls, when I think of the dearness of you, Peter, and the goodness of the people we know, Mr. Crayler, Meep, Dirk, the vegetable man, all risking their lives for us every day. When I think of these good things, I'm not afraid anymore. I find myself, and God, and I. Peter interrupts, getting up and walking away. That's fine, but when I begin to think, I get mad. Look at us, hiding out for two years, not able to move, caught here like, waiting for them to come and get us. And all for what? 
We're not the only people that have had to suffer. There have always been people that have had to. Sometimes one race, sometimes another. And yet, that doesn't make me feel any better. I know it's terrible trying to have any faith when people are doing such horrible. But you know what I sometimes think? I think the world may be going through a phase, the way I was with Mother. It'll pass, maybe not for hundreds of years, but someday. I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are really good at heart. I want to see something now, not a thousand years from now. He goes over, sitting down again on the cot. But Peter, if you'd only look at it as part of a great pattern that we're just a little minute in the life, she breaks off. Listen to us, going at each other like a couple of stupid grown-ups. Look at the sky now. Isn't it lovely? She holds out her hand to him. Peter takes it and rises, standing with her at the window looking out, his arms around her. Someday, when we're outside again, I'm going to. She breaks off as she hears the sound of a car, its brakes squealing as it comes to a sudden stop. The people in the other rooms also become aware of the sound. They listen tensely. Another car roars up to a screeching stop. Anne and Peter come from Peter's room. Mr. and Mrs. Von Don creep down the stairs. Dussel comes out from his room. Everyone is listening, hardly breathing. A doorbell clangs again and again in the building below. Mr. Frank starts quietly down the steps to the door. Dussel and Peter follow him. The others stand rigid, waiting, terrified. In a few seconds, Dussel comes stumbling back up the steps. He shakes off Peter's help and goes to his room. Mr. Frank bolts the door below and comes slowly back up the steps. Their eyes are all on him as he stands there for a minute. They realize that what they feared has happened. Mrs. Von Don starts to whimper. Mr. Von Don puts her gently in a chair and then hurries off up the stairs to the room to collect their things. Peter goes to comfort his mother. There's a sound of violent pounding on a door below. For the past two years, we have lived in fear. Now we can live in hope. The pounding below becomes more insistent. There are muffled sounds of voices shouting commands. Aufmachen! Da drinnen! Aufmachen! Schnell! 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 Etc. Etc. The street door below is forced open. We hear the heavy tread of footsteps coming up. Mr. Frank gets two school bags from the shelves and gives one to Anne and the other to Margot. He goes to get a bag for Mrs. Frank. The sound of feet coming up grows louder. Peter comes to Anne, kissing her goodbye. Then he goes to his room to collect his things. The buzzer of their door starts to ring. Mr. Frank brings Mrs. Frank a bag. They stand together, waiting. We hear the thud of gun butts on the door, trying to break it down. Anne stands, holding her school satchel, looking over at her father and mother with a soft, reassuring smile. She is no longer a child, but a woman with courage to meet whatever lies ahead. The lights dim out. The curtain falls on the scene. We hear a mighty crash as the door is shattered. After a second, Anne's voice is heard. And so it seems our stay here is over. They are waiting for us now. They have allowed us five minutes to get our things. We can each take a bag and whatever it will hold of clothing. Nothing else. So, dear diary, that means I must leave you behind. Goodbye for a while. P.S. Please, please, Meep, or Mr. Crailer, or anyone else, if you should find this diary, will you please keep it safe for me, because some day I hope. Her voice stops abruptly. There is silence. After a second, the curtain rises. Scene 5. It is again the afternoon in November, 1945. The rooms are as we saw them in the first scene. Mr. Crailer has joined Meep and Mr. Frank. There are coffee cups on the table. We see a great change in Mr. Frank. He is calm now. His bitterness is gone. He slowly turns a few pages of the diary. They are blank. No more. He closes the diary and puts it down on the couch beside him. I'd gone to the country to find food. When I got back, the block was surrounded by police. We made it our business to learn how they knew. It was the thief, the thief who told them. Meep goes up to the gas burner, bringing back a pot of coffee. It seems strange to say this, that anyone could be happy in a concentration camp, but Anne was happy in the camp in Holland where they first took us. After two years of being shut up in these rooms, she could be out, out in the sunshine and the fresh air that she loved. A little more? The news of the war was good. The British and Americans were sweeping through France. We felt sure that they would get to us in time. In September, we were told that we were to be shipped to Poland, the men to one camp, the women to another. I was sent to Auschwitz. They went to Belzen. In January, we were freed, the few of us who were left. The war wasn't yet over, so it took us a long time to get home. We'd be sent here and there behind the lines where we'd be safe. Each time our train would stop, 
at a siding or a crossing, we'd all get out and go from group to group. Where were you? Were you at Belzen? At Buchenwald? At Mauthausen? Is it possible that you knew my wife? Did you ever see my husband, my son, my daughter? That's how I found out about my wife's death, of Margot, the Von Dons, Dussel. But Anne, I still hoped. Yesterday I went to Rotterdam. I'd heard of a woman there. She'd been in Belzen with Anne. I know now. He picks up the diary again and turns the pages back to find a certain passage. As he finds it, we hear Anne's voice. In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Mr. Frank slowly closes the diary. She puts me to shame. They are silent. 